this um, really wonderful work on dequantizing machine learning algorithms. Uh, thanks. <laughs> okay, so um, I gave a talk in the Quantum Bootcamp a couple weeks ago um, that's kind of about similar things. Um, I decided that since I have the opportunity, uh, another opportunity to talk, I'll talk about something. Get, get a little bit more technical, so apologies for that. Um, okay, so first, let's talk about some context. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to be talking about this work, uh, which is joint with uh, Nai Hui, Andrash, Tong Yang, Han Xuan, and Chen Hao. Um, right. Um, so there's been um, a recent line of work that's basically trying to um, solve sort of a problem with um, quantum machine learning research, which is that a lot of quantum machine learning algorithms, um, they're sort of like quantum linear algebra. And these uh, algorithms run in time polylogarithmic in dimension, right? Um, and in order to do this, they make strong input assumptions. Like, let's say uh, I, have my, I, have, I can make input states corresponding to classical data, right? So I can, ha like, I can like weight uh, my quantum states corresponding to the weight of input data. And so this quantum machine learning algorithm gets time sort of like exponentially faster than any sort of machine learning algorithm. And the question is whether this is something that can manifest in practice. Um, so is this like an exponential speed up that you could use um, eventually? Or whether under similar input assumptions, classically, you could also find a corresponding classical algorithm that basically does the same task, maybe with some polynomial slowdown. So basically, the question is whether this exponential speed up, this ostensible exponential speed up, is manifesting because of the input assumptions or because of the quantum. Um, and there's been a recent set of work that sort of suggests that there is no exponential quantum speed up. Um, if you sort of assume that you're given your input data classically, so you can, um, so you can compare classical and quantum, um, and also you, uh, these, and uh, you can you can remove this exponential speed up or exponential separation if your quantum algorithm needs to operate on low rank or close to low rank data. And the way this is argued is by giving um, log dimension time classical randomized linear algebra algorithms in some sort of in, in a in a input model that's supposed to be analogous to the quantum input model used for quantum machine learning. So namely, I'm talking about this, uh, this QRAM here. Um, and so, so this is sort of like um, the line of work that we're going to be building off of. Um, this work is also inspired by this uh, singular value transformation framework for quantum uh, linear algebra. Um, there's been a recent set of works that has generalized a lot of the ideas behind um, a lot of quantum algorithms, like this quantum walk stuff and um, sparse matrix inversion and quantum machine learning. And it's able to do this, uh, generalize this into like a, a broad quantum linear algebra framework. Um, the general idea is that um, given a specific assumption on your input matrix, you can apply a singular value transformation of that matrix to a quantum state. Um, so this is, this works for this, this block encoding condition. Um, don't worry about it if you haven't seen it before. Um, uh, basically, this is just going to serve as like inspiration for what we're going to do moving forward. Um, and we're going to be considering uh, QRAM-based algorithms. Um, and I'll explain more later. Um, so given that this, uh, quantum, uh, this singular value transformation unified quantum algorithms, the question is whether we can do the same thing to unify these quantum-inspired algorithms, because they're all using different uh, ideas, or I guess uh, they're, they're all like proving everything from scratch. And, and so um, uh, our, our main result is that we can give a CU decomposition, um, which is, as Robbie mentioned before, I'll explain again in a little bit. Um, we can give a CU decomposition for an even singular value transformation of an input matrix um, in this sample inquiry access model that I mentioned before. And further, all quantum inspired algorithms um, sort of up to now can be recovered as basically like corollaries, simple, simple corollaries of this main theorem. Um, 
And essentially, what you can think about this is, is, is as like a classical version of QRAM based singular value transformation. But there's some, like, slight, there's some slight difference in the function specific parameters there. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about some um, of the, the groundwork first. Um, so I'm going to be using the singular value decomposition a lot. Um, this is just an expression of A as you know, two unitaries in a diagonal matrix. Um, the sing with the, these are like the singular va vectors and singular values, respectively. Um, in this context, the Frobenius norm is the, basically the L2 norm of the um, singular values. And I'm going to be using uh, the singular value transformation notion, which is that given this function f that operates on scalars, um, I'm going to use f of a to refer to applying it to, um, uh, I'm going to say f of a is a, except I've applied f to all of the singular values. And this is like a, this is like the essential notion that basically a, a lot of quantum machine learning algorithms can just be written as um, some type of like singular value transformation on your input. Um, right, so here's kind of what um, this QRAM based singular value transformation that I mentioned looks like. Um, the idea is that we have a bunch of copies of some input state and um, we're able to get as output um, a polyno like a, a singular value transformation of A applied to V. So here I'm using this ket V to refer to just uh, um, this like weighted superposition. Position. And here I'm uh, assuming that A is in QRAM. Um, and so, um, and that P is like a degree D polynomial. So there's an assumption that you need to be working with polynomials here. Um, and the thing to notice here is, is as I mentioned before, this runs in time uh, a logarithmic in dimension. Or I guess it might be like polylogarithmic depending on how you count. Um, and um, so the question is whether this is actually manifesting in like some sort of um, exponential speed up. So you should think about this, uh, by the way, this uh, Frobenius norm over spectral norm will come up a good amount. Um, you can think about this. This is called the st uh, like stable rank in the classical literature. Um, you, you can think about it as an analog, a smooth analog for rank. Um, it's bounded by the square roots of the rank of A, so it's kind of, it kind of makes sense. Um, so the thing to notice about this algorithm is that this, like, we, do, we do run very quickly, um, but ooh, it got cut off there. Um, but we need some way to prepare these quantum states corresponding to V and to get something useful from the output. Um, and further, like we, I guess we also need to like put A in QRAM as well. Um, and all of these are not sublinear time in general. And since having these input and output be quantum states, um, and assuming that your A is some sort of nice block encoding, these are all strong assumptions. Our classical algorithm that serves as an analog will need similarly strong assumptions. Um, and what we'll use is sample inquiry access as an analog. Um, so, uh, so for quantum machine learning that looks like, um, in, like input in quantum state to output in quantum state, we'll be studying the classical analog, which is sample query access to input to sample and query access to output. Um, so um, I'm going to define this notion. Um, and it turns out that this, um, it turns out that algorithms Dequantize what I call dequantized algorithms, that is, algorithms that are in this um, model, serve as good analogs to these quantum machine learning algorithms. That is, um, under pretty, pretty reasonable assumptions, um, if you have a fast algorithm in, in the sample and query access model, then uh, we don't know how to give an exponential, like, like there are no exponential, except like, a, um, then, then basically we can conclude that this quantum machine learning algorithm um, does not give an exponential separation. Basically, this is a weak enough assumption um, if we assume that the data is given classically. Um, so 
I'm going to go ahead and define this uh, sampling query axis now. Um, okay. So we have sampling query access to a particular vector. Um, if we can quickly compute entries of that vector, um, we can measure x in the computational basis. That is, I, I just want to sample a particular index i with probability proportional to x i squared. This is also called length squared sampling. Um, and I also want to efficiently determine its norm. Um, so you can see that this is actually a pretty weak assumption. Um, if you assume that your input data is given classically, um, then it makes sense that if your quantum algorithm gets to have quantum states, you get to at least have measurements of them. Um, but actually, in, a, in most cases where, if, where quantum machine learning um, operates, you can get these measurements classically um, without going to a quantum state. OK. And correspondingly, for a matrix, we have sampling query access to that matrix if we have sampling query access to all of its rows. And also um, A tilde, which is the um, vector of row norms. So the ith entry is the norm of the ith row. Um, and just to note here, um, if we have an O of t time algorithm in this model, um, then actually getting sampling query access is just building a data structure. And this takes time. Um, uh, basically like linear uh, in the number of non-zero entries, uh, N and Z, of your input. Um, and so you can basically translate um, an algorithm in this notion to a standard algorithm and, and a standard classical algorithm. Um, the reason I mention this is because um, the, this, is, this, this sort of bound without the polylog is basically the ideal, uh, the sort of the, uh, the runtime that a lot of uh, classical randomized linear, linear algebra algorithms shoot for. Um, so we can think about this as a sort of like a restricted model, um, or I guess a, um, a version of classical algorithm where um, we have a re more restricted notion of what we can do with this NNZ time. Anyways, um, so now that I defi I've defined the sample and query access, um, you might start to see some connections to Ravi's talk. Uh, where there's this observation that sample and query access speeds up uh, machine learning and randomized linear algebra um, a lot. So I think this, maybe these two were mentioned explicitly in the previous talk. Um, and basically, um, how we do this is that, how, we, um, how this can speed up machine learning is by um, considering the following. Um, sketching, sketch of um, the, the ability to sketch down input matrices. So, um, so if we have a matrix A, we'll say that uh, we can give an important sampling sketch of A um, if um, S's rows are chosen uniformly at random um, and they look like this. So they're basically, um, they have a one in a, one, uh, they have um, they're basically what, what these SIs are. are they're, they are um, selecting rows of A. Um, so how you can form S is that you sample from A tilde, and then you um, take the I that you get from sampling, and then you uh, rescale that particular row. So what I'm saying here is that SA is the thing that we want, right? And then when you take SA, you get that the um, SA is a normalized subset of rows of A. And um, this, is, this is exactly <coughs> what Ravi talked about as columns, the column something? Yes, this is exactly what Ravi talked about um, with columns. I'm using rows because I have a slightly different convention. Um, yeah, so this is exactly uh, what he discussed before. Um, and the thing to notice is that um, because we had sample and query access to A, so that means we could sample quickly. Um, this means that we can find this SA really fast, so in time independent of dimension, just O of S time. Um, and further, uh, you can think about this to verify. It's a little annoying, but, um, but given sample and query access to A, you can actually simulate sampling query access to SA and SA dagger. 
Um, um, and this is just, you have to just think about it a little bit. Um, but the nice thing about this important sampling sketch is that you basically inherit sample and query access from A. Um, right. Sorry, I'm slightly confused. In the first entry, you said you can find SA. Isn't aren't the number of entries in SA much larger than all the SA? Right. When I say find, I basically mean, um, so I basically mean when I say this SQ of SA, um, I, I mean I take O of S time, and then I have S sample and query access to these to SA. Okay. Um, okay. And again, something that Ravi said is that um, this important sampling can approximate matrix products. So if we have sample and query access to A and B, then we can approximate A. Uh, a conjugate transpose B um, by SA and SB, where these are uh, sketched down versions of, of A and B. And we get basically additive error here. And, um, and we get additive error by taking samples, a number of samples independent of dimension. So, um, and here, again, as before, our, our S. Um, SA and SB are normalized submatrices of A and B, and so you have sample and query access to all of your approximations as well. Um, and so if you found all of the access model stuff confusing, um, it's fine because this is actually the only thing that we use. So um, if you believe that um, performing these sketching ske sketches of uh, approximating matrix products um, if you believe that you can do that fast, then everything else just follows from this primitive. Um, effectively, um, effectively, the sort of sample and query access model, um, the only thing that we, don't, yeah, I guess, uh, the only thing that we use about it is that you can approximate um, these matrix products quickly. Um, okay. So, this is just what we're going to use moving forward. So just approximating a dagger b, and 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 look, notice that what we're doing here is that we're reducing a dimension down uh, in this matrix product down to s. And since we get sampling query access to the approximations, we can use this repeatedly to reduce dimensions in matrix products. Um, so um, if you do this thing of repeatedly uh, reducing matrix products, eventually you're going to be left with um, something called an RUR decomposition. So this is just a variant of the CUR decomposition, where here um, I'm looking at a particular matrix A, and then instead of uh, having a CUR where uh, the C is the column, column is a subset of columns of A and the R is a subset of rows of A, um, instead I just want um, R1 and R2 to both be normalized subsets of rows of A. Um, and yeah, so here we're thinking of R1 and R2 as independent of dimension. And U is, is like a small matrix. It's also independent of dimension. Um, and so you might be able to see how you could get this by repeatedly approximating matrix products. Um, and I'm going to. Um, so, um, so, and in fact, uh, this is basically all you need to give analogs to quantum machine learning algorithms. Um, and the reason for that is that if you have an RUR decomposition and you have sampling query access to your, say, like your uh, uh, input vector, so this is, this is the analog to A being in QRAM. Um, and if you have sampling query access to V, which is equivalent to V being your input quantum state, then you can have sampling query access to R, uh, this RUR V, um, which is basically like the desired output expression. And your blow up is this thing. Um, so R1, R2, as I mentioned, was independent of dimension. It's, there's like 
1 over epsilon and log 1 over delta here. And this is kind of like you can think about it as um, it's enforcing uh, sort of like a stable rank condition and also a cancellation. So you can think about like um, if you have a, uh, if you're familiar, sometimes quantum machine learning algorithms require a projection. And this projection succeeds with a certain probability. This encodes that probability. Um, um, so, so this is like kind of what's happening. There's also an, a stable rank in there. But in any case, um, uh, it's, you don't need to worry about it um, because this is just what this this turns out to work for quantum machine learning um, analogs. Yeah. Uh, which polynomial? The, the blue up. Um, it's maybe squared. So the R, R1, R2 is linear. 1 over epsilon might be squared. Um, and this might be squared. Um, the, 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 the main contribution will be from the R1 and R2, actually, um, because that will be something like 1 over epsilon squared. Um, okay, and um, so I'm going to assert that for our applications, it suffices to find an RUR decomposition. I'll show this a little bit more later. Okay, and now we can get to our main theorem, which is this even singular value transformation I mentioned earlier. Basically, if we have sample inquiry access to A, and we have some sort of smoothness conditions on F and uh, F bar, which is F of X over X. So this is our f that we want to perform the singular value transformation on. So this Lipschitz condition means that you know, if f is smooth, then the derivative of f is bounded by L and then correspondingly for f bar. Um, and the idea is that we can find an RUR decomposition for f of a dagger a. Uh, we're, this is what I call an even singular value transformation because um, you can, this is like applying even functions to your singular values. Um, and R and U uh, have basically this, this R in the dimension, which is uh, this expression. And then it takes R squared C time, where C is this. Um, so I'll explain more about what this, how to interpret this stuff. Um, but first, uh, I want to show the proof because it's really simple. Um, or a proof sketch. The idea is that we want to apply um, f of a dagger a. Um, we want to approximate, sorry, f of a dagger a. And to do that, we have a dagger a, and we have sample inquiry access to a. So we approximate the matrix product. Um, and so R is like this SA I mentioned earlier. So we approximate a dagger a, um, and we get these smaller matrices R dagger R. So these dots are representing dimensions that are bad for me. So these are like the M's and the big M's and the big N's. Um, and so these are the dimensions I don't want to see. Um, and then what I can do is I can write this F of R dagger R as this expression. So um, recall that F bar of X was equal to F of X over X. So what this is saying is that, um, for example, if like R is a scalar, this is saying that f of r squared is equal to r squared times f bar of r squared. So this kind of makes sense. Um, and you, you show this by looking at the singular value decomposition um, in any case. So you just write this as, as this. Um, and the reason that you do this is that, that now you can approximate this, um, this matrix product here, this r, r dagger, using that you had sample inquiry access to our dagger because you had sample inquiry access to A. Um, and then so you can approximate it again into something even smaller. And this is your RUR decomposition. So R was a subset of rows of A. And this is a um, matrix that's independent of dimension. Um, and so this is RU. So, sorry. Yeah, I guess, I mean, the usually the the sticky point is when x is close to zero, but you're finishing that with the Lipschitz constant of fx over x. So then when x is close to zero, potentially it could be high, but 
that's that's something you have to pay anyway. Right. right. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is basically why. Yeah. You. You. The yeah. The Lipschitz constant will. This is why it works for low rank things, but not things that aren't low rank. I suppose. Yeah. Um, so this is the proof sketch. If you take these tilde, tildes and or like a approximations and then write the full thing out, you get the thing that I said before. So this is the section that I was talking about. Um, so kind of to give some intuition here um, uh, behind these numbers. If we only wanted additive error, which is basically kind of like, um, so if you think about epsilon times spectral norm of a, f of a dagger a, or I guess you could uh, really what you um, you are looking at is like sort of the maximum f can be. That's sort of the additive error here. Then if you need r to be independent of dimension, recall that this is exactly what we needed in order to uh, have our class our classical algorithms be um, as fast as the quantum algorithms. Um, then we need L to be not much larger than this constant. So uh, basically what's happening here is that if F is like a linear function or something, then L is exactly equal to this expression. Um, and uh, so kind of what's going on is that uh, L needs to be not much, like it needs to be like non-smooth, not as much as you would expect. Um, or, or, sorry, there's a certain amount that you would expect L to, um, sorry. You would expect L to be a particular uh, size based off of like how large F can be. So this is what this max is. And basically it says that L can't be much larger. Um, and this, uh, as Ravi, me Ravi mentioned, this L prime really encodes. So L prime is the Lipschitz function of uh, the Lipschitz, Lipschitz constant of F bar, and this is really encoding like a low rank condition, kind of. Um, um, and if it if A is actually low rank, if it has a minimum singular value, then you actually do get that C is R uh, with some condition number factors onto it. Um, Right. Um, okay. So I'm going to skip this slide, I think. Um, so uh, if you wanted to know how these, these like previous theorems affected the applications, um, so basically we can rewrite all every all of our applications in terms of singular value decompositions or singular value transformations. Like this recommendation systems um, algorithm from Karanidis and Prakash. Um, the idea is that we want, want to sample from the i throw of A times this projection matrix. And what this projection matrix is, is you can write it as a singular value transformation. And then so you can approximate it by RUR. And then, as I mentioned before, we can, we can, get, sam we can get a sample from RUR times a vector, which is exactly what this is. Um, there's a support vector machines application, which is uh, getting sample and query access to um, this expression here. And if you notice, this is exactly a singular value transformation. Um, you have to uh, adjust it to make sure it, uh, it thresholds at a particular singular vector, but then uh, everything goes through. And you have RUR times a vector as desired. Um, to get uh, low rank matrix inversion, so like A pseudo inverse B type results, um, what you do is you write A pseudo inverse B as like a, in, like, in terms of like the normal equations, I guess. Um, so you write it in terms of, in, in this way. And then again, A dagger A pseudo inverse, this is a singular value transformation. I approximate it by R U R. And then I have R U R times a matrix times a vector but I have sample and query access to A and uh, R, so I can approximate this RA dagger. And I get, um, this, is, this is an RUR decomposition, so I get an RUR decomposition. This is the R, this UW is the new U, because R, um, 
had small heights and large width. So now it has small height and small width. And so that's, it basically just follows through. And uh, notice that this, uh, this technique works for any odd function. And so if we wanted to, for example, do Hamiltonian simulation, uh, we, re we write it as an odd function, odd function plus an even function, and then approximate them, each one individually, and then uh, do the same thing that we did for the odd case over here. Um, OK. So, um, so generally, uh, so this is my slide on like exponential speedups in QML. Um, so generally, none of this affects this HHL and uh, basically sparsity-based block encodings. And so these still give exponential speedups, but it's not clear how to apply them in practice because uh, input data isn't well-conditioned enough. And uh, um, basically, this, this, this work is, is arguing um, that this QML and low-rank data um, basically showed potential for avoiding these issues of conditioning. Um, but uh, there's a lot less hope for it now, um, now that these sort of wide framework papers, this uh, wide, wide, um, wide swaths of dequantized algorithms exist. Um, and QML and quantum data is still fine. Um, still seems like you can get speed ups there. OK, thanks. So what is the definition of the conditioning of your input data? Do you refer to the matrix or the vector? The matrix. The previous slide. Oh. The input data is not well conditioned enough. Could you elaborate? Um, uh, I guess, like, what I mean is I mean the, um, I mean the matrix, but I guess it's like fine if you, uh, it's fine if your input data is like close to low rank. Uh, like if you have a bunch of vectors that are supposed to uh, be somehow kind of low rank and then like you want to uh, perform PCA and then like dimensionality reduce another vector, then you, you only need that vector to be like, like it's basically like jointly you need the vector in the matrix to have be in the sort of the same subspace. So if you have a vector which is uh, prepared from some easy to get uh, vector and apply some low depth quantum circuit to it, that's still fine. That, sorry, fine means the, the <coughs> quantum still has an advantage. Is that right? Or, sorry, say that again. So what I what I mean is uh, from the size <coughs> side of the vector, it doesn't. I don't know how, what you mean by the low rankness of that particular right side vector. Yeah. I guess I'm talking about a few things at, at the same time. So, could you say what is the requirement of the uh, client side vector? Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. And any other questions? Okay, so uh, thanks very much. Uh,